Welcome to Season 2 of White Shores, the podcast for spiritual beings having a human experience. Let me invite you to walk once more beside me on White Shores to talk about the real meaning of life and being sensitive, intuitive, a mystic in a material world. Let's talk about dreams, rituals, personal transformation, the possibility of an afterlife, angels and other infinite possibilities. Season 1, recorded in 2019, featured interviews with some of the world's leading scientists currently researching consciousness, the existence of the mind separate from the brain. Listen to those mind-opening interviews if you can, because they left clear footprints in the sand for the carefully selected healers, psychics, mediums, authors, artists and experts featured in season two to follow and speak to us from their hearts, the place where all love and wisdom begins, and to speak to us in 2020, the year the world turned upside down and spiritual clarity needed as never before. So, now the scene is set, let's walk barefoot on the sand and then pause a while to gaze together at the horizon to see what magic lies beyond the material. Thank you for arriving safely today on White Shores. I'm glad you are here. We are living in extraordinary times because of the pandemic and our dreams are reflecting that reality with studies showing we are dreaming more vividly and frequently than ever before. This increased dream activity is happening because most of us have altered our sleep schedules and are getting more REM sleep, that's the stage of sleep when most dreams happen, and also because times are so emotional right now and your dreaming mind is simply trying to help you make sense of it all. I've never had so many readers messaging me about their amazing dreams or as much media interest in my HarperCollins Dream Dictionary A to Z or requests for expert comment from radio and newspapers. That's why I have the guest of my, and I hope your dreams today. She's a world expert in lucid dreaming. Now, that's the ability to know you are dreaming while you are dreaming. I touch on this in my dream books, but not nearly in enough depth, so I think you are going to love this interview. Do stay tuned after the interview, because in this episode, and indeed every episode in season two, I'm offering you a musical gift, played exclusively for this episode, and in keeping with the theme of the episode, it's for you to meditate or visualise with, and it's also as a thank you to my guest for their time, and the remarkable work or research they do. It will be played by my son Robert, who is a Royal College of Music scholar. I truly believe great music is the language that spirit speaks, and listening to it can help unite logical and creative parts of your brain and bring you harmony, inner peace, and something the whole world needs right now. The name of the piece will be given in the show notes. And if you're listening and don't think you dream, you do. You just aren't recalling your dreams. Dreams love it when you pay attention to them or think about the possibilities of them. So chances are you will dream after listening to this episode when you go to sleep tonight. You may want to listen to it again just before you fall asleep to really focus your spirit on the land of your dreams. Be sure to to place a notebook and pen beside your bed and then when you wake up to write down any images or symbols or feelings that come into your mind as soon as you wake up, because if you don't write it down straight away, you will forget. And you really don't want to forget your dreams, because as you'll hear in this episode, dreams are potentially life-changing gifts, messages from your spirit. Their aim is simple, to help you face any fears, learn and grow, and find your meaning and a sense of your infinite possibility. Stay tuned. If you would like to find out more about my books, warning, I'm a serial spiritual writer, there are a lot of them, my research, my media appearances and online talks and events, as well as my latest title and opportunities to win free gifts, please do visit www.teresachung.com and subscribe to my newsletter. 
If you want to listen to season one, you can find it on the podcast page of my website. And all episodes of both season one and season two are available on iTunes or wherever you download your podcast. Be honoured and grateful if you could leave a review there, as it helps the podcast get wider circulation and spreads the word that spirit is real. Walking beside me today on White Shores is someone who can help you wake up in your dreams. With the pandemic altering sleep cycles, and if you are in quarantine, slowing down your morning routine, people are reporting that they are dreaming more often and dreaming more vividly. It's called the lockdown dreams phenomenon. Now, I've written many dream dictionaries, as you know, to help people interpret the symbolism of their dreams, but there's one kind of dream I want more of and I want to know more about, and that's lucid dreaming. Knowing you are dreaming when you are dreaming. And I have the perfect person. I've admired her work from afar for a while, and it's, it's so exciting to have her here today. For 25 years, Dr. Claire Johnson has been researching and writing about lucid dreaming, and she was the first person in the world to do a PhD on lucid dreaming as a creative tool. She's spoken at conferences and international multimedia platforms on lucidity, sleep disorders, and the role of lucid dreams in healing and dying. She was honoured to be the president of a large and wonderful global dream community, the International Association for the Study of Dreams. She offers lucid dreaming ocean retreats. Oh, that's so in line with the title of White Shores, isn't it? In beautiful Portugal. And her newest lucidity guide, The Art of Lucid Dreaming, is a super practical book with a lucidity quiz and many lucidity programs so readers can fast track their way to lucidity as unique sleepers and dreamers. And you can find out how to contact Claire at the end of our interview. So you know, but I know you're going to stay with this because, it. you know, you love dreams. I know that. So you're going to love talking to this amazing, clever lady. Hello, Claire. Hi, Teresa. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm really happy to be here today talking to you. Oh, it's, well, it's, it must be funny hearing it yourself, isn't it? You suddenly realize, oh, my goodness, I've done all these things. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Oh. Complete, complete respect, complete respect. Oh, thank you. It is wonderful to speak to a fellow dreamer and dream enthusiast. Have you noticed increasing numbers of people dreaming vividly right now due to the lockdown? And why do you think that is? Yes, I really have. A lot of people have been talking to me about this and writing to me. Um, I think it's because, uh, partly because a lot a lot of people are working from home, so they don't have to get up uh, with the usual stress that they get up with. So that means that they're more likely to recall their, their vivid dreams. We have a, a phase of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, at the end of a night of sleep. So the morning hours are the best time to have these vivid dreams and remember what we were dreaming about. And if we don't have an alarm clock stressing us out and immediately racing into our morning routine, then we're more likely to remember these dreams. And it is is a gift even if uh, some of these uh, dreams um, have increased levels of anxiety I mean um, I've just written a book about nightmares and it's really fascinating how we can work with nightmares for healing and transformation so if people out there are suffering from kind of anxious dreams then please know that there are ways to work with these dreams uh, for empowerment for healing and to actually gain um, clarity about your life's path and where you're going so i see it as a very positive thing that there's about 35 to 40 percent increase of dream recall at the moment apparently reported in people because of the lockdown situation um, and yes a slight increase I think um, actually about 15% increase in dreams that are more anxious or dreams about shadowy figures or about bugs um, or diseases uh, and actually for my own dreams what I've noticed is social distancing immediately entered my dream life um, it was very interesting to see that. So I'd be in a dream and I'd be uh, observing the, di the distance between people and thinking, wow, those children are playing together and they're doing really well at keeping a two-meter distance between them, you know. <laughs> um, so it, 
it instantly came into my dreams. I haven't had any dreams yet about people wearing um, face masks, but I mean, this is only just starting to happen that people are getting masks on uh, in Germany, which is where I'm based. So I'm sure once I see more people wearing masks, I'll dream about that too. Because dreams do that, don't they? They absorb everything that we're experiencing in our daily life, all our emotions, moods, our preoccupations, and then they put them together in this amazing stream of imagery and give them back to us as a present during the night and that's a present that we can work with uh, for healing and transformation oh that's so beautifully and eloquently put thank you and you're right it's such an emotional time now and when time when times are emotional we, we tend to have much more vivid dreams don't we as our dreams are trying to help us yeah. make sense of it all that, that's that's my take on it would, would you agree absolutely absolutely that is one of the main functions of dreams uh, to help us to process emotions and we I mean there are very very strong emotions around this whole health crisis um, of course all of us are going to know at least one person who is vulnerable um, elderly has health conditions, um, and we may feel very worried about them. We may feel worried for ourselves. We may be worried because we've lost our job. I mean, there are so many ways in which this crisis is impacting people. So our dreams are helping us to process all the change that we're going through. It's actually very healing to dream. Um, It's one of the main uh, functions as well of sleep you know we heal on the physiological level through the deep sleep cycles and then we also have this psychological healing that quite naturally takes place I sometimes think of um, nightmares as being a little bit like um, sort of a volcano you know when you have too many very strong emotions uh, at some point they've got to come out like a stream of lava coming out of a volcano um, and that releases the pressure and the tension so even if we've had a, a bad dream it's important to remember okay that dream came to help and heal me on some level on some level it's helped me to process my emotions and it might also be a little red flag saying oh here's an issue you need to look at you know you're getting a bit too anxious Uh, And our dreams often give us solutions as well. So when we work with the imagery, we can actually often really find some wise guidance to help us through difficult periods in our life. Thank you. As I think like we've got our own internal counsellor or therapist and much cheaper than a real one. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Much cheaper. (laughs) But I love the fact you said we're not probably not dreaming more often. We just have the luxury now of slowing down a bit and remembering them because a big problem for a lot of people, they think they don't dream, but they are, aren't they? They're just not remembering. Exactly. It really is true. Yeah, we all dream every single night. Um, So the fact of if people come and say, I I don't remember my dreams, I don't think I do dream. I always reassure them, yeah, you, you do dream. It's just it's just a question of building in that habit of remembering your dreams and uh, the, the perfect time I mean we have many mini awakenings during a night of sleep where we can also just say to ourselves as we turn over or shift positions in bed what was I just doing who was I just with how was I just feeling and then we'll be able to bring the dream back and recall what we've just been doing in it And in the morning, of course, again, if you don't wake up with the stressful alarm clock, just lie in the same position in your bed and just think back to what you were just doing. And this is a really nice, easy way of remembering dreams. Um, So it's it's valuable to be able to remember them. And I think more people are going to start remembering their dreams um, in this in this period, which is great because it's the perfect time for dreaming. If you think about it, you know, nobody's allowed to travel at the moment. But in our dreams, we can fly. We can go wherever we want. We can. I mean, I in a dream two nights ago, a lucid dream, I flew over the blue ocean and it was so gorgeous. It was such a feeling of freedom because I'm really missing the sea. And I was planning to do this ocean retreat next month, which doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do. I'll have to bring it online instead. And I just kind of, it's just so gorgeous to be able um, to be by the ocean uh, or be wherever you want to be. You can also visit your loved ones in your dreams, you know. I've had a lot of very social dreams where I'm hanging out with my family and friends because obviously I'm missing being able to do that right now. Uh, so it's, and it's you can use it as a, as a form of um, compensation, you know, what you do in your dreams. And you can influence your dreams either by incubating a dream. That's when you ask for a particular dream. So if you're really missing someone who you can't visit because of the 
lockdown, then you can ask, you can form an intention to meet them in a dream. You could write it down on a postcard, put it under your pillow and think about it before you go to sleep and try and create that dream, make it happen. And of course, when you lucid dream, that means when you become aware during a dream that you are dreaming right now, that gives you the ability to be able to guide and shape the dream. So if you become lucid in a dream, you say, hey, I'm, I'm dreaming right now. You could then decide, oh, I want to I want to visit my mother uh, or I want to uh, go and see my friends in Australia, uh, whatever it is you want to do. And you can also connect uh, with deceased loved ones in your in your dreams, you know, bring bring them back to, for a hug, whatever it is you need. So you can really guide and shape those experiences, those dream experiences. Oh, I love the way you talk about it. I can tell you're a dream expert, dream lady, because when you're speaking, it's like you conjure up these beautiful images. I can see, I can visualize what you're saying. You have a way of telling stories with what you speak. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's absolutely beautiful. It's like you're painting a picture Aww. of dreams. And I'm, I'm sure people listening will, will love that. Thank and you. also, people, you heard what Claire said, write down your dreams the moment you wake up because you're going to forget otherwise. She was in, saying as soon as you become conscious in the morning, that's the yeah. time to write them down. Why do we forget them so quickly? Well, I think a lot of it has got to do with the fact that as soon as we are aware of ourselves in our physical body, in our bed, our mind just switches into what am I doing today? Oh, I've got to get up for work. Where's my, oh, I didn't iron my clothes from last night. Oh, I've got to give my, ch my child breakfast. I've got to do this. Um, and so we just switch straight into waking consciousness, which is why it's so precious to be able to lie in bed in the morning, feeling all connected to your dreams and just lie in that same position and let them return to you. And once you've once you've got them in your mind, then you see these images, they're vivid, they're real, they have color, they have emotion. And then if you write them down, or you can speak into a recording device, if you don't want to have to write things down, um, and then you've got them then. And they're much easier to work with once you've written them down or recorded them in some way, because then you won't forget them during the day. And don't expect them to make sense. Just write them down. That's what I say. Just yeah. make sense of them later. Just write them down. Just write them down. Please. They're just such golden messages from your unconscious. You don't want, want to miss them. But you've already touched on lucid dreams. I love that because this is what I really want to talk to you about. Lucid dreams fascinate me. Um, I love that movie Inception, you know. I, <laughs> I want to have dreams like that. Oh. But I haven't trained. I mean, I've dipped my toe in it. Can you please tell uh, listeners about lucid dream a little bit more about your training and about how people can train themselves yes I mean I often say to people um it, the, one of the most important things as you've said as well is keeping that dream journal because that opens up the lines of communication between us and our unconscious mind and the more familiar we get with our dreams with the images the symbols within them the more likely we are to recognize when we're dreaming and another good thing to do is just really become more aware of your state of consciousness right now you know I mean it's like we always think it's so black or white you know you're either awake or asleep it's just so not the case though if you tune into your state of consciousness during the day you'll find there are many shifts in consciousness so sometimes you'll be a bit tired or daydreaming in that kind of trance state um, you might be super focused and working really hard um and as you lie down and relax in bed at night, you start to enter a different state of consciousness then as well. And there are also the pre-sleep images. Now, this is a really crucial gateway for lucid dreaming. So I don't know if you've, if you've noticed this for yourself, um, but when you, when you lie down very, very relaxed and you, your mind starts to drift, you get these images coming up and they're often really quite strange images. Um, and if you manage to stay aware and kind of watch them, they'll develop, they'll start to grow and move and change. And these are the building blocks of dreams. So they'll start to become three dimensional and they'll move and they'll become whole scenes. And then you can just actually step into those scenes or fly into those scenes and go directly into a lucid dream from the waking state. So that means it's actually possible to fall asleep while remaining conscious. And that sounds like a total paradox, but it really can work. I mean, a, 
a lot of people think that's you know that's their preferred way of becoming lucid i must say it works better if you try that during an afternoon nap um, because during an afternoon nap the brain chemistry is optimal for lucid dreaming because you know your your body is quite tired and would like a nice rest but your brain is pretty active and alert and then you'll often go straight into rapid eye movement sleep which is when all these vivid surreal crazy dreams happen and they're easier as well it's easier in those dreams to recognize that you're dreaming something really strange happens you see a flying giraffe you think oh hang on a minute <laughs> a flying giraffe i must be dreaming you know uh, I mean, I often notice as well that I'm dreaming by the feeling in my body. So if you tune into your physical body right now, you know, we're aware of the weight uh, of us sitting on our chair, maybe our feet touching the ground, perhaps there's, you know, a little itch somewhere or something, you know, you feel that you're in this body. But when you're in a dream body, you're light, you're floaty, you can you can move up into the air, you can run without your feet touching the ground. Um, and your body can can shape shift as well. So if you start tuning into your body and the way it feels while you're awake, then you'll notice more when you're in a dream body. So many times I've become lucid because I've realized that I'm kind of floating and I'll look down and yes, my feet are off the ground, you know. So that's another way of, uh, of kind of becoming more aware. Another good thing to do is um, practice meditation. If we meditate just for like five or 10 minutes before we go to sleep, that clears our mind of, of other things, you know, the daily kind of thoughts that we have in our head. And it, it sort of clarifies our consciousness. And then when we mix that to the mingle that with the intent to become lucid in our dreams, that can be very powerful. The power of suggestion is important uh, and also really wanting to wake up in your dreams. And I also ask my dreaming mind if I want a lucid dream. I do this thing, I, I haven't heard anyone else who does this, but it works for me every time. So I'm lying in bed and I'm going to go to sleep and I want to have a lucid dream, very relaxed, my eyes are closed. And then I shout inside my head, I shout out, dreaming mind, dreaming mind, I want to have a lucid dream tonight. And I shout that once or twice until I feel like the message has got through. And then, uh, amazingly, my dreaming mind will help me to become lucid. So I'll get dream figures uh, looking at something and nudging me and saying, that's dreamlike, isn't it, Claire? You know, And uh, I have to be, yes, it is dreamlike. And then realize, oh, my goodness, it's because I'm lucid in a dream. Or I'll notice just something will happen. Someone will come and tell me, hey, you're dreaming right now. I mean, that's happened before. So your dream figures, your dream people, your dream animals will help you to become lucid. Once you've decided you want to do it, your dreaming mind is happy to help you. Well, that's um, and of course, the more you the more you do that, the more it's like anything you practice. The yeah. more you practice, the more skilled that you get. It. It's interesting when you say about these checks. You know, am I dreaming checks mm. during the day? Because right now, I mean, when I do venture out and people are like with their masks on and stepping aside, I often think, is this a dream? You know, oh, no, yeah. <laughs> it's like this is like some apocalyptic dream that I've had in the past. I'm sure I've dreamt this before precognitively. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You may well have done as well. You may well have done. Yeah. I think quite a few people dreamed precognitively about the coronavirus, and I find that yeah. fascinating too. Um, I've heard people telling of dreams where uh, there are there are kind of there are men dressed up in you know, in these protective kind of costumes and other people spraying bug sprays all over the street and releasing something dangerous into the environment, things like that. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting to track people's dreams before and during uh, this whole pandemic. Yeah, I'm sure that there was an increase because I've worked on a book called The Premonition Code with, with Dr. Mossbridge yes, and um, yeah. We recorded all that, and that we we did record a lot of them um, before. It is really, but at the time, of course, you don't know. But then you look back and think, "Oh my god!" Mm. But I'm sure I've had these dreams of of big suits and everything. It's yeah, it's utterly fascinating. But I want to go back to your training. Have you trained in it, or are you self taught? Well, <laughs> I'm self-taught, really, uh, and I've also done the training. I did a PhD on uh, lucid dreaming as a creative writing tool. Uh, but you were the first, first person to do that. I was the first to do that. Yes, that's right. Um, but Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> but um, my real training started from when I was really a tiny little girl. I mean, my, my first uh, glimpse of lucidity 
was when I was three years old and I had a dream, a really vivid dream of drowning in a gorgeous turquoise swimming pool. I was happily swimming and then I realised that I was sinking deeper and deeper, couldn't get up to the surface, I completely panicked um, and then there was this like flash of understanding and I realised, okay, I can either stay here in this pool and drown or I can wake up. And I chose to wake up and I rolled my body really violently in the swimming pool, rolled it over and over so violently that I actually rolled out of my physical bed and landed on the floor with a bang. And then my mother came running, you know, wondering what on earth was going on. I told her I, I dreamed that I was drowning. And she said, oh, OK, Claire, though, it was only a dream. It wasn't real. And that really was a very strange moment in my life because I thought, there was nothing more real than that, you know, that that mm. pool was so real, the colours, the turquoise water, the feeling of drowning, the panic, and that my shadowy bedroom with my mum saying, it was only a dream, you know, it seemed much less real. So then I realised that there was this huge uh, distinction between the waking world, which all the adults seemed to believe was the only one that mattered, and that this incredibly rich, vivid inner world that nobody really knew how to respond to when I talked to them about it. Um, my family just thought I was eccentric when I would tell them, I, I went flying over the house last night. <laughs> They'd be like, yeah, all right, love, just get on with your homework. <laughs> so um, so I, I always had this, there was always this kind of split um, where I understood there were two different worlds. And I, I, began, I mean, I had so many nightmares as well, and I had to learn to deal with the fear on my own. I had so much sleep paralysis, um, which is when you feel like you're trapped in your body and you can't, you can't move or speak, uh, and strange things happen. But I learned over time, I had to learn from my own resources how to calm down in those states, in those scary states, how to deal with them, how to breathe. Um, and... It, I was so fascinated by everything that I experienced, uh, also kind of deep space experiences where there's no dream imagery. You're just like floating in this massive, well, eternal black space or white space. Um, and, and I was so fascinated by it all that I thought, well, I, I have to study this. I have to find out more. There's not enough information out there. And the one thing... Um, the reason all my books are so practical, I always um, have these original practices within them that are very simple for people to use on their own, is because I never had that. And I would have so loved to have had a book that says to me, hey, if you're scared in this dream space, you can do this, you can do that. You know, you can create a whole beautiful lucid dream out of sleep paralysis. You don't have to lie there feeling trapped and crushed and scared and lonely. You can change things. And nobody, nobody was ever able to say that to me. So I think I, what I really want to do um, with my life's work is to help people to navigate every experience that we have within the world of sleep, because it's a fascinating, mysterious, amazing world. And most of us miss it. We miss out on it. Uh, we just become unconscious for eight hours or so and, and, and you know, don't even try and remember our dreams. But Dreams can teach us so much, and not just the dreams that have imagery, but the ones, those, those states of consciousness where you're lucid, you're floating in what I call the lucid light, and you feel this utter connection, total oneness, your ego self disappears, and you're floating in this numinous, amazing light. And it's like, it's like returning to the source of all creation. And those dreams, I feel, teach us how to die as well. They teach us how yeah. to raise our consciousness and expand our consciousness so that we are prepared for the moment of death, you know, so we can release and move back into that light, which is where, I mean, I think we all emerged from that light and we return to it when we when we die. Um, so yeah. th it can really take you very deep, lucid dreaming, uh, or just, just dreams in general. They can bring us so much hope and Oh, they can heal us on so many levels and help us to advance spiritually and become more compassionate people so that we can, yeah, help other people too. You know, I think that's also part of why we're here, you know, to, to learn, but also to help others. Oh, you're speaking my language. I love everything you're saying. It's like in your, in your dreams, you can experiment with what you want to be or who, you can be whoever you want to be in a safe environment. Yeah. It's so much possibility there for healing, for learning, 
for finding out the infinite potential yes. that you are. And do you think that the more you um, take charge of your dreams, as it were, and create scenarios that you want, the more that translates into your waking life? And there's a Sonoy tribe, isn't there, or the dreaming mm. tribe, that, where they talk about, you know, that, that, that dreaming is so much a part of their culture. And from a young age, children are taught to lucid dream and to take charge of their fears like if a tiger came up to them how would they deal that in a dream in the yeah. hope that in their real life they've rehearsed that scenario yeah that's and right and save save their lives i, I love that yeah idea. so in the senoi tribe they 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 always say go towards danger which is another way of saying face fear in your dreams so if there is a tiger you face it you know and you extract a gift from it in some way you know they they encourage people to do that too and they and this is this is about empowerment and yes i think that when we learn to empower our dream self then we also empower our waking life self and when we practice reality creation in a dream we also learn more how to practice reality creation in waking life because the dream is a thought responsive environment it responds spontaneously and instantly to our beliefs, our desires, our thoughts, our expectations, our hopes. It's like an amazing, beautiful telepathy with this communication with the dreaming world. And when we understand how that works, we see that in lucid dreams, um, it's so transparent. You know, you, you're in a lucid dream, you're standing in a park and you think, oh, I wish my cat was here. And then you feel its tail curling around your leg, you know, there's your cat. This is, this is reality creation. Um, okay, it's really fast and instant in the dream, but we also can create our own reality in the, the sort of the slower waking world. You know, it may take longer to manifest something in the waking world, but we can do it in the same ways by managing our beliefs, our hopes, our expectations, and not getting too bogged down by fear. This is something I see in many people that they live their lives in fear. And it's really good to be able to release as much fear and anxiety as you can and dreams like working therapeutically with your dreams doesn't have to be with a therapist you can do it on your own um, that can be really helpful to just release those those overwhelming fear, feelings of fear or not being in charge of your life um, so dreams can very much help us to live a more empowered life but um lucid dreaming is not just about controlling the dream uh, in fact, I, I think it's very beautiful to have a lucid dream where you go spontaneously with the flow because our dreaming minds are so creative. And it's wonderful to be able to just ask a question of the dream environment, environment for example, you know, like, what is my life's purpose? Or what happens when we die? You know, how can I help other people? And then the dream will respond. And it's absolutely marvellous um, how, you know, it's like a real intense communication with the deepest part of your unconscious so that's very valuable too not just to control but to relax go with the flow be spontaneous in your lucid dreams and very respectful as well of this deep wisdom that our dreams carry for us brilliant and i hope you don't take this the wrong way but i think this is the one podcast in this series and everybody can't wait to go to sleep <laughs> exactly <laughs> You have this wonderful ability that I admire of making it sound that the most exciting thing in the world happens when you put your head on the pillow at night. <laughs> um, that is, is is wonderful. I love that. I love that. You touched briefly on, on meeting bereaved loved ones in dreams. Mm. And I do know that people who dream of lost loved ones, I write a lot about grieving process and and um, people wanting to connect in spirit with departed loved ones. And I do know there's research to show, isn't it, that in about 85% of cases, people who dream of a departed loved one tend to deal better with the pain of grief. Yeah. And of course, we're living in a pandemic now, you know, bereavement's everywhere. So dre dreaming of a loved one is a wonderful sign, isn't it, of continuing that relationship in spirit yeah. which people think ends with death but it doesn't it can carry on in your dreams oh yes it can be incredibly healing to to just hug your deceased loved one you know if you especially if you weren't able to say goodbye and that's the one of the terrible things about the pandemic is that you you can't say goodbye to your loved one if they're rushed to hospital you're not allowed to visit them 
Um, so it can be very, very healing to see them in a dream and be able to speak those final words of love. And, and it helps you to accept that they're doing OK. You know, someone just wrote to me the other day, an Indian woman. She was so sad that her grandfather had died. What could she do? And I said, well, you could incubate a dream, send him an invitation, write it down on a postcard, put it under your pillow and he'll come if he can. And he did come. And she said when he came, he was radiant. He looked much younger and uh, they hugged and she said how much she loved him. And then she said to him, do you miss me and grandma? And he just smiled at her with love and kind of just very gently shook his head. And she said she woke up from that dream and she cried, but she realized that he has gone somewhere where he feels happy and safe and that it was the right moment for him to, to, to leave, to go, uh, to transition, to die. And so that helped her, she said, to, to accept that he's gone, but he's all right. And that's what we want to know, isn't it? We really want to know that they're still okay, you know, because they, we just don't really know what happens after death. So it can be super reassuring um, and, and, yeah, help with the grief process to have that very strong feeling, he's okay, it's all going to be okay. And on that beautiful note, can you tell people, first of all, where they can find out about you, how they can message you and about your books, please? Oh, thank you. Well, I have a website, which is deeplucidreaming.com. And uh, yeah, you, there's loads of information there. Um, and you could also e email me uh, if you have questions about lucid dreaming, sleep paralysis, nightmares, any aspect of sleep or dreams. And my email is deep lucid dreaming at gmail.com um, and then all my books I mean you can find them uh, on Amazon or order them from any bookstore uh, and they're all kind of listed on my website so yeah I'm quite easy to find. <laughs> Is there one book in particular that you recommend as the best starting point for people new, new to your work? For people who are very new I mean there's the book Dream Therapy uh, which is called Mindful Dreaming in the US version that's a that's a book which doesn't it doesn't focus all the time on lucid dreaming. It's also about kind of how to find the deeper message of your dreams, how to work with grief and loss, um, how to work with healing dreams, soul dreams, and so on. But if you're interested in kind of getting lucid in your dreams, you could try the art of lucid dreaming. That's the one, the newest one. And if you're someone who really wants the kind of academic, scientific, historical aspect, or, you know, kind of the really big book that I wrote is the Llewellyn's Complete Book of Lucid Dreaming. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. And I've got a nightmare book that's going to come out in February. I've finished writing that. I'm really relieved to have finished it. It was <laughs> a crazy book to write. <laughs> but, um, but amazing. People that wrote to me and shared such incredible transformative nightmares. It was really very, very moving moving and touching uh, to be able to work with those dreams um yeah thank you i'm i'm so privileged to be able to speak to you and oh. and at last it's it's absolutely wonderful thank you well, thank so you, much Teresa. for taking the time and please do check out this amazing dream expert dream lady whatever you want to call her she's mm -hmm. she rocks she's really great dr claire johnson Oh. And I'm just going to end this podcast with my usual um, light-hearted um, uh, attempt to find Lord of the Rings fans out there. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question that you shall not pass, because if, if people are listening and they know the right answer, please email me at angeltalk710 at aol.com and you'll get a free gift. So <laughs> don't worry if you don't know the answer, because it's a win-win, isn't it? If you know the answer, you look really clever. <laughs> If you don't know the answer, someone has a free gift. So, of course, um, your question is going to be related to the, some of the dreams in Lord of the Rings. Um, what does Frodo dream about in the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring? So this is a question for me. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't read that book in like a century, so I have no idea. <laughs> Probably a ring. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> could be anything well, I'm very glad you got it wrong the first person who gets in touch with me and you're entitled to a free gift um, of course <laughs> dreams are very big in Lord of the Rings but I won't go on about my passion for Lord of the Rings dreams at the moment because um, I'm sure my um, listeners and readers have had more than enough of that so anyway thank you thank you Dr Johnson oh. I really appreciate it Oh, thank you, Teresa. It's been wonderful to chat to you and thank you for all the work that you do. It's also really fascinating. So thank you for helping people do it. And please keep doing what you're doing. The world needs it right now. Oh, thank you. Same to you. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 
And before this episode closes with a musical gift for you to close your eyes and visualize the pure love, wonder, beauty of White Shores, I want to thank you all from my heart for being present and for being you. Keep being amazing spiritual you. The world needs your compassionate light more than ever. Thank you also to Clan Re for the opening theme track. And if you have any questions, stories or insights you want to share with me, you can always connect to me via my Teresa Chung author pages on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube, as well as www.teresachung.com and my trusty Angel Talk 710 at aol.com email. I aim to reply to everyone, but bear with me if things get busy. And now it's time, the language that the angels speak, music takes centre stage. If you want to know the title of the piece, which is played by or selected by my son and Royal College of Music scholar Robert, because it resonates powerfully with the theme of this specific episode, you can find the title in the show notes. Sending you my love and gratitude.